So I was helping out a little bit at the museum today and we noticed that one of the exhibits was having a bit of trouble. So I've brought it home with me just to have a little look over it. So this is the inline digital display unit uh, display <laughs> from the display display. And this thing is uh, something that I found on eBay. I gave one to Sam and he's made this awesome contraption uh, with a uniselector from a telephone exchange and an organ switch so that it cycles through all the numbers that are projected by this display. But if we turn it on, you'll see what the problem is. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, already it's having a bit of trouble. See, what's meant to happen is I tap this once and it goes around all of the uniselector, all of the numbers, but it's not doing it. It's just stepping one at a time. And <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> quite a few sparks along the way, which is not what is meant to be happening. Also, some of these, uh, well, look at that. A six that is definitely not displaying right so we're gonna have to figure out what's going on with the display which is gonna be a separate problem from all of the switchy switching so this isn't gonna be an in-depth look into how this thing works uh, Sam's already done a great video of that on the museum channel this is gonna be more of a kind of methodology of like tracing problems and how to go about trying to fix some things like this and if I can do it anybody can do it because I'm a complete numpty so the way I'm going to approach this is just a process of elimination. We're going to think about what we do know works on here and then that will help us narrow down to the area that we need to concentrate on. What I do know is that when you press this button down, the relay is <laughs> is, uh, is working and switching. So the relay itself, the coil of wire, is fine. Just the interrupter function is not working, it's not automatically switching itself around the semicircle. Okay, so now I'm pretty damn sure that all of the components are in good working order. Um, I need to look at all the electrical connections, uh, so that means that I need to familiarise myself a bit with the circuit. And I've not worked with these exact type of unit selectors before, so I'm going to have a look at all those connections and familiarise myself with it. And once I know basically how it works, I'm going to be able to pick up on the clues that it's giving me much better. And and a little bit of knowledge can go a long way. Your number one friend in this kind of diagnosis is normally the continuity setting on your multimeter and good to have it on the bleepy setting. All that does is just tell you if two points are electrically connected so you can tell if there's a break in the circuit. So likely we're looking at some connections with the interrupter circuit gonna go look over the whole thing and make sure there's no loose wires first of all. Well I've had a good look through all the interrupter wiring and it's all how it should be. A good thing I guess. I mean it would have been nice to come across an easy fix but we're not gonna be so fortunate this time. The good thing with this is that just like if you're building a kit of a synthesizer module or something I can guarantee now that this combination of connections is the right way to do it. I know that this did work at some point. So I know I don't have to think about moving any of these wires to try and make it work. It will work if I can just restore it to its previous state, which is reassuring. I'll give you a little brief overview of how this works just so you know what we're looking at. Uh, at the top here, there's this row of terminals and they are connected to the positive power. And so from these terminals, that goes down these little bits and it goes into the wiper here. Now the wiper, every time the relay goes on and off, advances one position on here. And those contacts there are going through onto these ones on the outside and all of these are all connected together. So we've got the power coming in here, going in through the wiper, going into these, coming through here and getting connected all the way around. And we have this green wire here and that is going over to the back of the unit selector and coming into this metal plate here and you see there's a switch here because when this is in its downwards position that little metal bit is not in contact with it the switch is open and then it's closed open closed and the other half of that switch is going to the positive side of the relay so when the switch is closed the relay is going to turn on like this and you'll see that Every time it goes on and off, the wiper on the unit selector gets advanced one time. But you'll also see that when it turns on, that switch there gets opened. And so no power is going to the relay and it turns itself off. Pretty clever. And if you keep connecting power to it again, once it's closed, 
it will keep opening and closing and you'll see that this front wiper here after it's completed its semi-circle travel is actually just floating in midair that's why we also have the power connected to this semi-circle of contacts and you'll see the next wiper going across those there there you go so it does one semicircle on this side and then completes the full circle on this side and eventually once the wiper goes all the way around and comes to this one terminal here that is not connected to power the uniselector will pause and at that point we can manually advance it once with this switch and it will start the whole process again cascading through all of these contacts till it comes to pause again did you get that <laughs> so now that we know that we can see when it should be turning on and off itself it's not doing it and uh, so for some reason the power connections from the interrupter are not powerful enough to switch the relay. Knowing now that all the wires are connected in the right place, there must be another thing that's not making proper connection. The only thing left is the contacts of this switch and the contacts around where the wiper goes. Okay, so if I take the power and directly connect it to this side of the switch, it switches. If I connect it to this side of the switch, doesn't do it so it has to be the connection between these two pieces of metal we're going to give them a good clean and see if that makes a difference best addition to my toolbox lately has been toothbrushes really useful actually when you're doing a lot of this electromechanical stuff for getting in tight places to clean them i restored this teleprinter recently and this was the number one tool that i used and in addition we're going to use some electrical contact cleaner And this technique is advised by nine out of 10 dentists. The other dentist is just no fun at parties. <laughs> Nobody likes him. Ow. <laughs> I pinched myself in the organ switch. Okay, let's try it again now. Oh, okay, we're onto something. It's not doing it all the way around. That's working better. Oh yeah! Okay, well I'm just gonna keep cleaning it, keep trying to make that contact better, because that definitely seems to be the right way. And now I'm noticing another pattern. You'll see, it's not working how it should when the wiper is on this side of the unit selector. But when it goes to the other side, which is gonna start about now, yeah, it works perfect for all the contacts on the other side. This side of the Uniselector is doing something weird. So, let's try and figure out what that is. And I have also noticed another pattern. Seems to be repeating the same pattern of bad contacts on this side. Yeah, see there, it's skipping a few. It's doing that every time. So, I'm thinking that it's not to do with the actual wiper contact itself, the common contact, it is these individual ones, some of them are dodgy. Yeah, it's doing that every time as well. So yeah, that supports my hypothesis. And check this out. So it's having trouble switching. All right. But if I hold the uh, armature and the relay in a little bit, it does it much more reliably. And that's because it's needing less current less magnetic force to pull it in. So the resistance of this switch contact is not such a big deal. But there's an adjustment that we can do to make sure that this armature is a bit closer to the end of the coil. That is this thing here, so let's loosen that. But at the same time, it needs to make enough travel down here so that the actual switch can break. Right, continuing on with the cleaning. We're getting a much better result now. Still a bit glitchy. And the display is still not projecting how it should. It's doing it pretty good, but I've got another idea just to make it even more reliable uh, because I noticed that the second inner connections here on either side aren't actually being used. So I'm going to double them up in parallel with the other switches so that gives it double the chance that the connections are going to be good on each of the wiper positions and that should ensure it works for a little bit longer into the future. Alright so that means I've got to solder some wire around these terminals 
I'm trying to do this so I don't melt all the plastic on the other wires. It's a bit tricky. Right, let's take this off and I can get to the other side. Try not to lose the nut and bolt. I also try and not break any of these other connections. <laughs> Give ourselves more problems. Well, check it out. Beautiful, that's what it should be doing. And I'm just gonna uh, I'm just gonna spray some more of this contact cleaner in there, run it around quite a few times. Just absolutely maximize the chances that it's gonna continue working. And also I'll just have a look at all the moving mechanical parts, give them a bit of a clean, put a little bit of oil in there. But of course we do still have this problem where it's not projecting properly. Those numbers should all be centered in the middle of the screen. And they're not, so, ah, well, that's pointing towards the problem, isn't it? And if you watch my video on this, you'll know that inside here, there's some uh, lenses. So my guess is they ain't straight. And this is the one that I did take apart. So, you know, I've got to hold my hands up. This is probably my fault. <laughs> I didn't put it back together proper. Uh, so we're gonna open up the back and have a look at the masks because the lenses in here actually look straight. This that fell out here, this goes in front of the lenses and that just has some extra masking to make sure that you've got a sharp image and there's not any overspilling light. Right, so just a couple of screws on the back here and then we can pull the bulbs out. There they are, lovely. And I can have a look in the back. There's a block there that separates the light of all the bulbs so that you're only getting one number illuminated and you can see the masks. To get this block out you've got to undo these screws on the side here. Now let's tip this up, get this out. Oh yeah, well there's your problem. <laughs> so the way that I took this out was with a hairdryer because they were glued in and I heated up the whole thing till I could eventually push it out. And I'm always a bit wary about using super glue because I like to be able to take things apart again, uh, but it does mean that it's not so permanent. So I just used some hot glue to hold it in, which I thought would be fine, but uh, obviously has come loose. But this does present us with an opportunity to clean everything, so let's go ahead and do that. But let's drop these back in, making sure that the nice label is the right way up. You've got to remember, of course, that it projects them upside down, the lenses flip it. Just wipe my fingerprints off it. And this time I'm going to use something a bit better than hot glue. I'm going to use some hide glue, which has a quite low uh, melting point, so it's quite reversible. And this nozzle is not going to be useful for this, so I want to make sure that I'm not smearing glue all over these number masks. So I'm just going to use a little screwdriver and a little bit down here and apply it into the corners. Okay, I think we've achieved our goal. Let's let that go off and then we can reassemble everything. And then the same process in the front with this mask. And just while the bulbs are out, I did notice that some of them are a little bit dim just because of bad connections again. So I've sprayed a load of contact cleaner into these middle channels on the uniselector, which is controlling the switch into the bulbs. And you know, personally, I like the sparks, but uh, that could be contributing to why we're getting bad contacts. So I am going to go and add this spark suppressing capacitor. I don't want to. It's much more fun with sparks. But this Uniselector does seem to be particularly uh, well used from its past life. So uh, I think we've got to do everything we can to look after it. A lot of these things, they just need to keep working, 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 and they'll wear themselves in eventually, you know. So if you come to the museum, give this a little spin because it's actually good for it. So I hope you can appreciate not only how much work goes into making these awesome things, but also maintaining everything around the museum. These electromechanical machines especially need a lot of TLC. And if you think about it, the reason why this stuff became obsolete in the first place was because companies didn't want to pay a big team of engineers to maintain everything. So having a museum full of obsolete technologies yeah, that takes a lot of work and I would encourage you to um, support the museum and you can do that through the Look Mum No Computer Patreon page and there is a link below.